Asmat Guru Bhyo Namaha, Asmat Parama Guru Bhyo Namaha, Asmat Sarva Guru Bhyo Namaha. So we're continuing on with our discussion of uh, Mumukshapati, which is a book by Pila Lokacharya. It's a Rahasya Granta, um, dealing with the subject matters of the three main mantras which are taught in Samashrainam, in the Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya, Astakshara Mantra, Dwaya Mantra, and Charma Sloka, Om Namo Narayanaya, Sriman Narayana Charan Roshanam Prabhupadye, Shrimati Narayanaya Namaha, and Sarvada Mampuritija, Mami Kamsha Nambuja, Hamtva Sarvapathe Vyomokshi Shri Masi Jaha. So, and also we're discussing also the commentary on this by Manavala Mamuni. So this will be a Rahasya Granta or, a, or a, a book of the esoteric secrets of these mantras. Um, the Rahasya Mantra, the Rahasya Grantas or the Rahasya literature in general, both of the Northern school, the Wadagalais and the, and the Southern school of Sri Vaishnavism, the Tengalais, um, written by Vedanta Deshika uh, and uh, Pila Lokacharya res um, respectively. Um, they are normally, uh, they're normally taught to people after Samashrayana. And uh, it, it, in, in each, it's interesting to see the differences that, that come out between the different uh, Kalais, the different sects of Sri Vaishnavism on these subjects. But as I say, the Mamukshapati itself is a Tengalai text. Whereas if we were to, if we, if we were to say, if there's any um, one in the Vatagalai sect in the, that uh, counter, uh, that um, compares to it is the Rahasya Triasaram of Vedanta Deshika. So we could also go through Rahasya Triasaram sometimes just to see the differences, slight differences that Vedanta Deshika has on these topics. So anyway, in our previous discussions, we were we got up to Sutra number 74. The book itself, of course, is written in Mani Pravala, which is a mixture of, uh, it's basically Tamilized Sanskrit. So it uses Sanskrit jargon with Tamil endings. And so it's called Mani Pravala, which is, um, means mixture of pearls and, and, and uh, coral. Uh, okay, so we were, we, were, we were up to the 74th Sutra. So I'll just show the text on the screen and then we'll continue with the 74th Sutra. So, So we were talking in the 73rd Sutra, we're talking up to something about the, um, uh, we're talking about the, how in the Pranava or Omkara, we are in the Tira Mantra Prakaranam, which means we're talking about the eight, eight syllable Om the Monarayana Mantra. And we're talking about specifically about the Omkara, which is the first word, which is made up of three letters. Uh, heretofore, he has interpreted the meaning of the Pranava to be primarily the meaning of the dative case ending of the letter A. So, so there, the Pranava is made up of three letters, A, U, and M, Om. The first letter is A and it represents Srima Narayana, it represents God, because uh, the letter A is inherent in all the other letters of the alphabet. So, the, so God is inherent in everything in his relationship with the world and the souls as the uh, the substratum or the, uh, the the substance behind the attributes which are the the the, the souls and in the, the world, right? So he is he is essentially there like the letter A in all letters, um, and 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 the letter A also represents is represented by the word Narayana or, or God is also represented by the word Narayana in the Astakshara Mantra. And the word Narayana in the Asakshara Mantra has the, has the ending Aya. It has the, the ending of the dative case, two or four Narayana. Narayanaya means two or four Narayana. That's the dative case ending. So, so because the letter A in Om represents Narayana, and Narayana has the letter, the ending Aya on it, which means two or four Narayana, right? Um, similarly, there's an inherent understanding that the, 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 the dative case ending Aya is also there to be attached to the letter A. And we discussed this before that in a compound, Sanskrit compound, that only the last 
um, part of a compound, the last word in a compound, or the last part of a comp compound has an ending on it. The other endings are hidden and they have to be assumed and they have to be explained, right? Or, or they have to be interpreted. So here the interpretation or the understanding, the realization is that the letter A also has this inherent dative case ending. And that dative case ending shows the relationship of shesha, sheshi, or servant to master. That servant to master relationship. Because it means dative. It means that, that it is unto or for Sriman Narayana that the soul exists, that the soul serves, right? So the individual is the individual soul, the individual jivatman or atman, right? Serves the paramatman, serves Sri Manarayana and, and exists for his pleasure, exists for his service. Uh, and therefore that's the relation of Shesha Sheshi. And that is understood by the date of case ending, Aya on Narayan, Narayan Aya, and also the hidden date of case ending Aya on the letter A, in the, in the word om, om, or the pranava. He reveals yet another, another way to construe the pranava, which gives primacy. So that's, that's the first, that's the primary understanding of the letter A in pranava that he explains. And then he gives another, another meaning, right? That, that we can, so we can think of, uh, we can think of the letter A, which means Lord Narayana as, an, as a noun. If we think of it as a noun, then we add the state of case ending and we understand it in that way. If we think of it as a verbal root, then what verbal root would it be? It would be the verbal root of. So he reveals yet another way to construe the pranava, which gives primacy to the root meaning of, to protect. So in Sanskrit, there are, there's a, as I, I think I've mentioned this before, there's a, uh, there's a list of verbal roots, about 2,200 2, verbal roots from which many, many other words, both verbs and nouns are made. And uh, this verb of, this root verb of means to protect. So the Supreme Lord is also the protector. He's also the protector of this universe and the protector of all the souls, right? So that's a secondary meaning. That's a second, that's another meaning to the, to the letter A in the Pranava. Now, continuing on, we previously also described about what the letter U means, how the, the U, U means um, um, exclusivity, and it also can mean Mahalakshmi, and Mahalakshmi can also be included in the letter A also. And then we also, in our last uh, discussion, we discussed about the letter M, which is the 25th, uh, letter of the Sanskrit consonants, which which has to do with the jiva, which means the jivatman. So that also so, and then how Mahalakshmi stands between the two. If we consider you to mean Mahalakshmi, that she stands stands between the two as a brushikara or the mediatrix between the relationship between the souls M, represented by M, the letter M, who are like the children. And Srima Narayana, A, uh, who is like the father, she is like the mother who stands in between. She's the consort of the Supreme Lord, but she's the mother to the living entities, and she has a relationship with both, and she acts to mediate between them as Purushakar. So all of that we understood from Omkara so far, plus some other things, some other small things. So now, uh, with Sutra, Sutra 74 says, the letter A and the letter M, in Omkar, state the protector and the protected, right? Because remember, uh, we just mentioned that, that the letter A can be considered like a verb, a verbal um, root, and therefore it can mean to protect. So the letter A means protector, right? Whereas the letter M refers to the jiva, the jivatman, so it can mean the protected, because the jivatman is the one that's protected by Srima Narayana. The fourth case, ending, right? And the letter U stand for attainment or property, right? Uh, property of knowledge of Sheshatva, knowledge of servitorship, knowledge of servitorship. So there's a footnote here. So let's have a look at the footnote. So it says the, the phrase, 
rakshana, hetuvana, right? Hetu means cause, right? Prapti, the attainment, which is the cause of protection. Rakshana hetuvana, prapti, the attainment, which is the cause of protection, has been rendered uh, here in the uh, in the Mani Prabhala. Uh, it gives another uh, statement. And it says, the attainment, which is Sheshatva, the cause of protection. The cause of protection. So the attainment, which is Sheshatva, when he attains the servitorship of the Supreme Lord, he attains that protection by Malavala Mahamuni. So Malavala Mahamuni is basically saying that when you attain this, uh, this, uh, this mentality of being a servant of the Supreme Lord, then you attain the protection of the Supreme Lord. Right? When we do this, when we do property, we are surrendering to the Lord and therefore we attain his protection because we, ad we admit or we understand or we realize our true nature and the primary nature of the jiva of the Atman is that he's a servant. He's a servant of the Supreme Lord. There are other things which, uh, which the jiva is. He's a doer, he's an enjoyer. So in so many, there are so many things in Vedanta and the Upanishads which, is, which are mentioned, but the essence uh, that the Tenacharya Sampradaya is placing on the, on the primary aspect or, or attribute of the jiva is Sheshatva or servitorship or slaveship, slavery to the Supreme Lord. Since Seshatva is inherent and not something to be attained, right? So we're always um, uh, in the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya, they say, Nitya Krishna Das, eternally a, a servant of Krishna, right? So eternally a servant. The, the, and, and as we mentioned before, that the, the, the jiva is serving God either directly or indirectly. He, in this material world, even if he's covered with illusion or his knowledge is contracted and he's undergoing different karmas and he's completely illusioned and his, his bliss and his knowledge is covered, even then he's serving the Lord indirectly in this material world. So he's always a servant. He's always a servant. And even in this material world, he might serve others in illusion. He might serve his society, his friends, his family, but, but he's always serving. So it's the nature of the soul to serve. So once we understand who to serve, then we become rightly situated and then we become protected by the Lord. So since servitorship or sheshatva is inherent and not something to be attained, what must be meant is knowledge or understanding of sheshatva, right? So it's not that everybody, everybody is a servant inherently, but some people are serving other other deities or other their or their families or their their spouse or their society or their boss right they, they don't realize that they're actually meant to be serving the supreme lord Sriman Narayana so what is meant here is not and some people are also the other thing is also serving oneself self-serving right serving oneself involves ego or, or ahankara um uh, this is also a, a, a point that the Tenacharya Sampradaya comes up with. The, the Tingalaya Acharyas say, even when you perform Bhakti Yoga or Kama Yoga, Jnana Yoga or Bhakti Yoga, even if you're performing Bhakti Yoga, it's self-serving in the sense of you will want to attain moksha. You want to attain moksha and it's self-serving. So uh, we have to give up even being self-serving, even that little bit of, self e of false ego that we are performing uh, uh, an upaya, we're performing a means, bhakti yoga, and by our performance of the means, we attain moksha. Even that has to be given up because it's tinged with a hankar, a little bit of a hankar. So true sheshatva means that we are completely dependent and subservient and, uh, and controlled by the Lord. Uh, so anyway, again, since sheshatva is inherent and not something to be attained, uh, what must be no, what must be must be, be meant is the knowledge or understanding of servitorship or sheshatva, which is to be attained by the soul before protection can take place. Right? So we have to actually attain that 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 understanding. Attain that understanding. So, uh, which is the reason the reason for being protected and the goal. 
right? The knowledge. It is the knowledge of Sheshatra, the knowledge of servitorship to the Supreme Lord, that is that is what uh, is what leads to his protection. So the letter A, right, states that the Lord who is it states the Lord who is the protector, as we said, from the verbal root of to protect. The letter M states for the soul, states the soul who is to be saved by him. The fourth case ending states the attainment of knowledge of Sheshatra or servitorship, which is the reason for protection. The goal of such protection is, is the soul being employed for no other purpose than the Lord's servant. Service, excuse me. The goal of the protection of the, is, is the soul being employed for no other purpose than the Lord's service. Therefore, the letter U, right, which we said meant exclusivity, referring to subservience to no other, to only to the Supreme Lord, right? So it's not states the goal of salvation. So, so again, we are always servants. But if we think that we can, we're self-serving, we're serving ourselves or we're serving a family or we're serving somebody else, if we think like that, that's not really the, the understanding of Sheshatra which leads to protection. The understanding of Sheshatra that leads to protection is when we understand that we're subservient only to Sriman Narayana, that type of subservience. Thus he has revealed the meaning of the Pranava, the first word in the mantra. Right, so now we can also remember the, uh, from our classes on Trivachana Bhushanam. In Trivachana Bhushanam, it was mentioned that um, that the goal of salvation is attained primarily through the Lord Himself. He's the primary cause, and not even through the mantra. Um, Anyway, I forgot exactly what I was going to say at that point, but then uh, let's continue on. Then, in the in the order, in the in, in order to reveal, in order to reveal the meaning of the following words, he first shows that the rest of the mantra is an elaboration of the pranava. Okay, so now we've dealt with the pranava, we've understood its different parts, and we've understood what they mean and all the different aspects of each one and how they relate to each other. So now what he's going to do is he's going to explain how the rest of the Tira Mantra, the whole mantra, Om Namo Narayanaya, is simply an expansion of the Omkara. Right. So let's have a look and see what, um, uh, what P.B. Anangacharya of Kanji Puram has to say about the 74th Sutra. So again, the sutra says the Akharam, the letter A, spoke of the protector, right? The Makaram, the letter M, spoke of that which is protected. The fourth case or the dative case ending spoke of that which is the reason for the protection. And the Ukara or the letter U spoke of the result. So in the 72nd and 73rd sutras, the combined meaning of the pranavam of Omkara was shown in one way. There is sheshatram or servitorship that is in the, in the hidden fourth case inside the letter A was kept in focus. Now the root of the akaram, the, the verbal root of, of, of the letter A is used to show another combined meaning of the pranava of the omkar. The root of the letter A is taken as, as avarakshane, and uh, rakshane means to protect, and as the meaning of that root is protection, that is kept in focus and used to derive the meaning of the pranava here. The letter A, akaram, shows him to be the protector, meaning Srima Narayana. And the letter M, Makara, shows that which is to be protected is the Atma, the individual soul. The reason that he protects 
is because the Atma is enslaved to him. Therefore, the fourth case speaks of Sheshatvam, or servitorship, which is the reason for protection. The result of this protection is that the Atma, the individual soul, continues in the service of the same protector. And this fact that the Atma is un, uh, undeviatingly enslaved only to him is spoken of in the Ukar. Remember, because the Ukar means exclusivity. Thus, the Pranava or the Omkara speaks of, of the Rakshaka, right? The, the, the protector the Rakshaniya, that is protect, that who is protected, right, the Atma, and the Rakshanahetu, the cause of protection, the cause of protection, the cause of protection is what? Is the exclusivity, the, the, the knowledge of Sheshatvam, the knowledge of servitorship, right? The knowledge of exclusive servitorship to Sriman Narayana, right? That's the specific knowledge that has to be there. That's the cause of protection. And the Rakshana Prayojana, the result, the result of the of the of the uh, the protection. The result of the protection is, of course, moksha, right? Which is again, whenever we talk about moksha, we we define moksha as the eternal service to Sri Narayana in Vaikuntha. So, getting back to Sutra seventy five. So now we're going to try to understand how the full mantra, Om Namo Narayana, is an expansion of Omkara. Now that we understood everything about Omkara, now let's understand about how, the, it's a, how it, it gets expanded into the full mantra. So after this, the prana is elaborated. So there was a jeer, a sannyasi, Vadikeshari uh, jeer, explained in a book that he wrote called Deepa Prakash, right? That uh, elaboration means first stating the meaning appropriate to the context and then clarifying those previously stated meanings. So this, in the footnote, it says this is attributed to this book, Deepa Prakash by uh, Vadakeshri Jir. So in this book, he gives the expanded meaning, Vivarana Krama, of the three rahasyas, again the three the three mantras, right? Uh, he defined he he defined uh, elaboration, explaining the stated meaning and revealing further meanings is known by respected people as elaboration. So this is a like a, an explanation here. This is also attributed to. Uh, another book called Vadakeshri Karika, also known as Rahasya Traya, Rahasya Trayarta Vivarna, right, by Vadakeshri Vada Deer. Okay, so he explains how this is an elaboration of the Pranava. Okay, so that's just uh, giving first, first thing that. Uh, first, what is what is uh, Manavala Maman doing here? What he's saying is, let's first understand what an what a uh, a clarification and what an what a what an elaboration means. So, what does an elaboration mean? First, first means we have to state the meaning appropriate to the context, and then clarify the meaning, clarify those previously stated meanings. And then an elaboration means explaining the stated meaning and re revealing further meanings, right? Is, is considered an elaboration. Okay, so let's see what PB Nangacharya has to say about this sutra, number 75. Um, the parts other than the pranavam in the Tirumantra explain the pranavam. The parts other than the pranavam in the Tira Mantra, meaning Namo and Narayanaya are the other two words in the Tira Mantra, explain the pranava or they elaborate the meaning of the pranava. From here on, 
the Namaha part of the Tira Mantra, which is known as the Mantra Shesham, and the Narayanaya part have to be explained. So we can say Omkara is the first part, and then the rest of it, the Shesham is the rest, it also means the rest. So the rest of it is Namo Narayanaya. That has to be explained. First, it is said that the Mantra Shesham is an explanation of the Pranava. The second part, Namo Narayanai, is an explanation of the Pranava. Breaking a word or phrase into multiple parts and showing the meanings of each part is the usual method of explaining something. So you want to understand something, take it apart, understand the parts, then you can put it back together again and you'll understand it. So why would it be said that the Mantra Shesham, the Namo and the Narayanaya, the two, the two other um, uh, words, explains the first part? the pranava, the omkara, when it does not break the pranava part by part and show their meanings, when it does not break the pranava part, part by part and show its meanings. Even if it does not take the parts of the source and explain them, as it speaks of the essential meanings of the source and expands on it, the mantra shesham is said to explain the pranava. Right. That is, the collected meanings of the pranava, or omkara, that were shown before and explained in great detail by, by the remaining parts of the Tira Mantra. Okay, so it's just an explanation here of, just an explanation here of how he's going to, he's going to continue to explain how the rest of the mantra explains, elaborates on the omkara. All right, so uh, text number 76, the namas or the namaha or the namo, right? Because uh, namaha or namas becomes namo because of sandhi coming before the narayanaya. So om namo narayanaya, not namaha or namas, they change it. The namas, uh, the word namaha, right? Elaborates the letter U. Remember what the letter U meant? It meant exclusivity. So the word Narayanaya, excuse me, the word Narayana, right, elaborates the letter A. The fourth case ending, that is the Aya on Narayanaya, right, elaborates the letter M, which we know also um, refers to the soul. And what is the soul? The soul is a servant. So service is involved. In, in the letter M and is also involved in the, in the I of the dative case ending, which means two or four. So does the word Nara. So the word Nara comes in the word Narayanaya. According, so according to some people, also the word Nara elaborates the fourth case ending or service. When excluding subservience from others, excluding subservience to others, meaning exclusive service to, <clears throat> to Sriman Narayana only, the namas clearly excludes oneself as one of those others, these others, a meaning implied in the letter U. Therefore, the namas elaborates the letter U. So, in the letter Swami, U... That, yeah. Yeah, Swami, mm -hmm. uh, question. Is that why... Narada is called the, the, the Bhakta of Narayana based on the Nara concept. Narada. Hmm. I don't Narada. know exactly. The stage. Yeah, that's interesting. The word Nara is there in the word Narada too. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question. I'm not sure about that. We have to look up the derivation of the word. Uh, we could look it up in the dictionary and we could see if there's any etymological, um, uh, let's see, Narada, Narada. It says here in the dictionary, name of a Rishi, uh, a Kanva or, Kas or Kasyapa, author of Rig Veda, blah, 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 as a, as a Deva Rishi often associated with Parvata, and supposed to be a messenger between gods and men uh, from Mahabharata, Harivamsa, etc. 
uh, amongst the ten Prajapadis as a son of Brahma. In later mythology, he is the friend of Krishna and is regarded as inventor of the Veena or lute. Okay. Didn't know he was the inventor, I knew he was a player. Uh, especially in poetry, he is called a Deva, uh, Deva Gandharva or Gandharva Raja or simply Gandharva. And then there are other meanings for the word Narada, which may or may not mean that Narada, uh, son of Vishramitra, one of the 24 mythic Buddhas, uh, uh, name of a mountain relating to Narada. Okay, so uh, certainly the first part, the first part of the word Nara, Nara, Narada is uh, Nara. The second part would be da, and that could mean some, that could mean we could interpret that in different ways. So, um, what this is a better this is a this is grammatically this question is beyond me. Okay, so what I suggest is that we discuss this um, question with uh, my Sanskrit teacher, Dr. Chiran Ryan, and ask him if there's a hidden meaning in the word Narada, or if there's a not just a hidden meaning, but there's a meaning to the word Narada that the word Nara is there, and and how to how is it a compound that can be broken up into Narada and Da, Nara and Da, and how that could be um, how that could be interpreted. So, but that's uh, that's that's an interesting question. So we should we should definitely ask him. And please, you can remind me when he comes back on April second. You can ask him. Um, or I can send him an email. You can find out. Okay. Um, so here we have this this word Nara, Nara. But anyway, getting back to, if that's okay, we get back to I because I, I can't really take it beyond that. I looked it up in the dictionary and it's beyond me the the the, the etymology. It might be it might be mentioned in some text like that. It might be broken up into something and given an explanation. Interestingly enough, all these names that we find in the scriptures, Parikshit, right, means the inquirer, Shuka means the parrot, you know, all these names, Vyasa, the compiler, you know, the, all the names, uh, the proper names, they actually have some meanings behind them. And so we can, uh, we can understand that they, they have a, they're not just proper names that don't mean anything. You know, today, for, for instance, today we have, um, we have somebody who's called Smith. He has the name Smith, but uh, it means that in his genealogy back way back when, probably he comes from a, a family of people who used to be Smiths. They used to either be blacksmiths or different types of uh, artisans in that way. So naturally, we naturally when we see these names, we understand that they do mean something as well as just being personal nouns. So yeah, it's a good it's a good idea to to investigate the actual meanings of the of the proper nouns as well, and not just uh, not just take them as as a as a proper noun it doesn't mean anything. Um, okay, so anyway, getting back to the point here. So um, in the Sutra seventy six, he talks about the word Nara as being a part of the word Narayana. The word Narayana can be broken down into Nara and Ayana. Ayana means different things that can mean following. Um, Nara, Nara means man, it means person or human. So it can also mean, there's also another thing, Nara also can mean water, one who's lying in the water. So Lord Narayana is lying on Shesha in the water. Um, so there's different meanings to the word Nara like that. But here, what he's just saying in the last sentence of the, of the Sutra is he's saying that according to some people, Right? They have the opinion that the word Nara also, uh, as well as the, as well as the, uh, the fourth case ending, Aya, um, has to do with Sheshatram serv or servitorship. So in the first paragraph here of the commentary by Manavala Mahmud, he's saying, so we understood, we understood uh, that from the letter U in Omkara, the exclusivity that the, that the that the soul has to serve only Srimad Narayana, right? And so, so when we understand that, many people understand that to mean, oh, we only have to serve Srimad Narayana, but we also, it also means that we don't serve ourselves. We're not self-serving. 
right? So we have to give up ego also. And so here, the word nama, namaha, is made up of two things, na and mama. Na, mama, na, not me. Na, ma, not me. So as well as not serving others, we're also not serving ourselves, not me. We are serving him only. So that's why they say Nara. So when excluding subservience to others, right? Uh, namas, the word Namas, right? Clearly excludes oneself also. Not Because you say not me, it means not myself. So I'm excluded, right? As one of those others that is, that is served. Uh, a meaning implied by the letter U or exclus that exclusivity of the letter U. Therefore, namas or the letter nam, or the word namo in Omnimo Narayanaya elaborates the letter U. Okay. So the word Narayana clearly states number one, the nature of the Lord is protect and the Lord and protector. Number two, the souls and in sentient matter which are to be protected. Three, the qualities useful in protecting and saving them. And fourth, the method of protection. Thus, it elaborates the letter A. The fourth case ending explains that without doing something, kinchit karam, kinchit karam. Kinchit karam actually means uh, doing something very little doing something little, a little, a little service, a little, a little uh, endeavor. Uh, without doing something, service cannot be maintained. Without doing service, uh, the fourth case ending explains that without doing something, service cannot be maintained. As it is said, there is no subservience for one who does not do anything, right? So what are we, uh, serve has got to serve. A servant's got to serve. A person who's a servant, if he doesn't serve, he's not a servant. So obviously, a, ser a servitorship means serving. And one who does not do anything does not fulfill his subservience or sheshatva. Uh, and this, this comes, this is attributed to a couple of, there are a couple of statements in Mimamsa. Uh, usually when we say Mimamsa, we mean Purva Mimamsa or Karmakanda. There are these different ap ap aphorisms in Mimamsa, which explain how to, dis how to, how to understand different topics. And uh, from these, we understand that, uh, that just by the definition of, of uh, Sheshatva, of servitorship, it means that the person who is considered the servant has to serve. Right. So that's the fourth case ending, which explains what is done, what is to be done, Kinchitkara, the fourth case ending, says what is to be done. It says two or four Narayana, right? The Aya means two or four Narayana. So it's, it explains what is to be done. It also, it, uh, to allow subservience, sheshatva, uh, to, to be established, uh, uh, to, to be established elaborates the letter uh, M, right, which represents the jiva, which refers to the soul as the locus of sheshatva, the locus of servitorship, or the place, where, what, is the, what is the place of, of servitorship is in the servant, in the servant, and the servant is the jiva, and the jiva is represented by M. So the fourth case ending not only explains, not only explains subservience, but it gives us an idea of where the subservience is because the subservience has to be in the servant and therefore it elaborates the M which represents the servant. Some say that the word Nara is an elaboration of the letter M because it explains that the souls are eternal have one form, are many in number, etc., as indicated by the letter M. So I'm not sure exactly why all of those things are, are, are indicated by the letter M. 
um, but we may come across it here. Why is it that rather elaborating these in the order of the letters of the Pranava, they have been elaborated in a different order? Why is it that when elaborating these, right, in the order of the letters of the Pranava, which is A, U, and M, they have been elaborated in a different order? Hmm. So, what does it mean? It means the Shesha, the Namo Narayanaya part of Om Namo Narayanaya, right, is in a different order of subjects than the, in the Omkara. In the Omkara, we have Narayana first, then we have exclusivity, and then we have, and then we have, uh, then we have, and, and in, the, in the letter A, we also have inherently Aya, which it means two or four, the Supreme Lord. And then we have exclusivity. And then later on, we have the, the soul as, as the letter M. But in Namo Narayanaya, we have first Namo, which means not me, which means the soul, right? So that comes first. And then we have also, and also the idea of, of, of servitorship. And then we have later on the, the, the Aya. We have the, we have the, the uh, after Narayana, we have the fourth case ending. So we had the fourth case ending attached to A in the Omkara and attached the first letter and attached the last word of the Shesha of the rest of the mantra, Narayana. So that comes in a different place. And, and in, in the Omkara, we have, we have the letter M, which means the soul coming last in the, in the order of A, U, and M. But in the Shesha, in the rest of the mantra, we have it coming first in the, in the letter Nama, right? Or even in the letter, or even in the dis discussion of Nara. Nara also means the servant. Nara means the, the, the souls. So it's the other way around from the Omkara, from the rest of the mantra, the, the elaboration of subjects. So this is a question. Why is it that rather elaborating these in the order of the letters in the Pranava, they are elaborated in a different order in the rest of the mantra? Okay, so first of all, before we see the answer to this, let's see what Pibi Anangacharya says about, about this particular aspect. Again, Sutra number 76, the Ukara, the letter U, which is taken as Avataranam, Avataranam, hmm. Vataranam means the, the scent, right? Um, that removes Anya Sheshatram. Anya Sheshatram means subservience to others, right? Right? So it, so it means exclusivity, the letter U, right? Only, only subservience to Sriman Narayana is explained by the, part, by, the, by the word Namaha, right? The Namaha part. The Akaram, the letter A, which shows him, Sriman Narayana, who is the Rakshika, the protector, is explained by the Narayana part. Right. So Namaha explains the U, is, is equivalent to the U in Omkara, and Narayana is equivalent to the A in, 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 in the Omkara. So they're round the other way, right, in order. The Makara, or the letter M, which shows the Jivatma, that has the quality of sheshatram or servitorship, right, is shown by the dative case, the, the, the fourth case, the dative case, Aya, which comes at the end. So in that sense, uh, in that sense, that's the same, right? In that sense, that's the same because the M comes at the end of Omkara, also come, the Aya comes at the end of Narayanaya. So that, that part comes, is the same, right? But it is also said that Nara, which comes before the end, right? Become, comes Namo Nara, Nara Ayanaya, right? That also explains the Makara. In that case, if we explain it in that way, it comes out of order because the M comes at the end of Omkara and comes, and the Nara comes in the middle of Namo Narayanaya. Okay, so previously it was told that the mantra Shesham, meaning Namo Narayanaya, the last part of the 
after the Omkara in the Astakshara Mantra, explains the Pranava. So this is being shown here. The letter U, that, that means avataranam, right? And I'm not sure here what avataranam means, but it, it should mean exclusivity, right? Was shown to remove anya sheshatram. Anya sheshatram means to another, anya sheshatram, servitorship. So sheshatram, enslaved to oneself. Swa, excuse me, swa sheshatram, enslaved to oneself, is included inside the anya sheshatram. So being enslaved or being subservient to others, right, than Sriman Narayana, the others included in the group of others is also yourself. So you should not be enslaved to your king, your family, your society, your friends, to anybody else but Sriman Narayana, but also you should not be enslaved to yourself. You should not be self-serving. Therefore, Namaha, which removes the Sheshatam ex, uh, ex uh, therefore, the Namaha, which it removes the Swa Sheshatram ex explicitly, the word Namaha, the, the letter U says exclusivity. So it does remove it, it. If you look into it, if you look into it deeply, it means also not to serve yourself. But the, the, the word Namaha explicitly says not me. So it's explicit in its, in its, uh, uh, rejection of so being self-serving and that is uh, so that's the point being made here that it's an elaboration it's the same thing as the letter u the word namaha but uh it's it's more powerful because it 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 uh, it is it's 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 unmistakable that namaha means not myself so narayana explains in detail the nature of him who is the rachika the the protector, the nature of the chaitanas or the jivas, right? The souls who are protected by him, the gunas or the attributes, the qualities which are uh, required for protection and the method of, the, uh, of, of giving protection. Therefore, it explains the akara, the akara, which means narayana, right? Uh, explains all those things. Without doing some services, the sheshatram will bear no fruit. And the fourth case shows service. So the, 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 the ending ayah on the end of Narayan ayah shows the fruit or the goal. What is the goal? The goal is moksha. And what is moksha? It's service. Service to the Supreme Lord in Vaikuntha. And therefore that's shown in the end of, at the end, at the end of the shesha, the, the, the last two uh, words of the Omnamonarayana mantra. And also it understands that without, without service, there is no goal, right? And that without service, there is no meaning to the, to the servant, right? Servant has to serve. The, this fourth case explains the letter M, Makara, which shows the Atman that holds the Sheshatram, right? So as I said, without service, there's no serve, without the servant, there's no, without service, there's no servant. You're not a servant unless you serve, right? So if the ayah at the end of Narayanaya means service, then it also indicates the person who does the service, the soul. That has to be indicated there also. The atma, which is the meaning of the makara, or ma, um, makaram, the, the letter M, the atma, which is the meaning of the, the letter M in Omkara, has the qualities of being eternal, one, and many. These qualities are shown by the Nara part, right? So also this letter M, which represents the Jiva, is also shown in the Shesha, in the last part of the Astakshara Mantra, by the, by the term Nara. And therefore, it can also be said to explain the letter M, right? Because Nara and M, they mean the same thing. The, the individual soul. Ra comes from the root. Rig, rig, sha, shaye, uh, rig, ring, shaye, hmm. which means that which can be destroyed. Hmm. Therefore, Nara 
means that which is not destroyed. So nara, that which is not destroyed. Hmm. So it actually refers to the soul and not the body. So we can say, although we might translate the word nara to mean a human being, a person, right? It actually means the soul because the word, if we break it up, it means nara, not destroyed. The soul is never destroyed. The soul is eternal, right? Therefore, nara means that which is not destroyed. That is, it is eternal or nityatvam, okay? Through the meaning of community, this becomes nara, nara, which shows the quality of many. Hmm, I'm not quite sure what that means. Through the meaning of community, this becomes nara. So n long a r a who be na ara and shows the quality of many. Simil similarly, other qualities can be shown. Okay, so there, there are more meanings to the word nara than we are aware of. And so he's giving a glimpse of this and we'll ha I'll have to look into this a little bit more about what he means by um, through the means of community, nara. Uh, it shows the quality of many. So there are many, there are many eternals. There are many, hmm, yeah, not sure exactly about that. Okay, so anyway, let's go back to Sutra 77 and see further what we're going. So there was a question. The question is, again, why is it that uh, uh, rather than elaborating in the same order that the, that the subjects were elaborated in the Omkara, A, U, and M, how come in the Shesha, in the Namonarayanaya, they're elaborated in different order? To this he says, Sutra 77, this was not explained in order because the Lord must be experienced only after the obstacles have been cleared away. Okay, so this has not been explained in the order of the letters of the Pranava, A, U, and M, because one must first get rid of egoism or ahankara, possessiveness or mamakara, so I and mine. We have to get rid of this idea of I and mine first, and then we can explain, uh, explain things. Um, Etc. obstructing the experience of the Lord, uh, indicated by the word Narayana, uh -huh, which elaborates the letter A, then the Lord can be experienced. Okay, so, so the idea here is that in the Omkara, the letter A comes first, and that means the Lord. But in the Shesha, why is, Narayana, why is the word Narayana after Namo? Because only after the word namo, meaning not mine, after we give up our ego, can we understand Narayana? Because we can't understand our, ayana, our, our Narayana as long as we have ego, hankara, and mamakara, so I, the possessiveness or I and mine. Once we give up that possessiveness and give up that, that ego, then we can understand Sriman Narayana. So without giving those things up, we're in an illusion. We think that we serve ourselves or we think that we possess things ourselves, but in actual fact, it's the other way around. We are a possession meant only for him. And therefore only when we realize that by the letter, by the word Namaha, can we then fully realize the word Narayana. That's why in the rest of the Astakshara Mantra, the word Narayana comes after Namaha. Whereas in the Omkara, it comes first Without, have, without first understanding that knowledge of giving up I and mine and understanding Sheshatwa or servitorship only to Sriman Narayana and not even to ourselves, right? We cannot understand Narayana. So therefore it is better, the uh, Om Namo Narayana is a better understanding, is a better way to understand than simply the Omkara. Omkara doesn't give us that understanding because it, it puts Srimad Narayana first, the Supreme Lord first, before we've given up our ahankara, before we've given up I and mine, uh, I and mine, our possessiveness and our ahankara. That's very, very good. I, I really appreciate that. Which elaborates the array. Okay, so only then can the Lord be experienced correctly. 
That's the correct way to, to experience the Lord after giving first, after first of all, giving up our, our, uh, our false ego, right? And we can say, even, even when we greet somebody in India, we say namaste, nama, not me, you, not me, you, like that. And only after that, we can appreciate that person. We can, we can fully appreciate that person after giving up our ahankara and our possessiveness, like that. So that in the same way with Srimad Narayana. So next, so as to reveal the meaning of, of, of the namas, the middle word, right? Because we have Om and Narayanaya, and in the middle we have Namas or Namo, right? He states how the word is to be, how it is to be divided into two words. So we're going to go into an elaboration of what Nama means now, right? So we finished our, we finished our elaboration of the Omkara, and now we're continuing with the Shesha, the rest of the mantra, Namo Narayanaya, and now we're specifically going to take up the word Nama after having first of all talked about why Namo Narayanaya is in a particular order uh, and the subject matters of Om and the subject matters of Narayanaya in different, in, different, uh, in different orders. So therefore, now we're going to take up the meaning of the word Nama. So let's see what, first of all, uh, P.B. Anangacharya has to say about Sutra number 77. Okay, so again, the meaning of Sutra 77, why is the order of the pranava not followed in the mantra shesham that explains it, right? So the premise is that Namo Narayanaya is an elaboration of all in the mantra. So, but when we see, we've understood what all means and we've understood each of the parts in order. Why is it the order isn't the same order isn't, isn't used in the Monarayanaya for the parts of the Monarayanaya, the same subjects? So the Namaha that explains the, the Namaha, the word Namo, right, that explains the Ukara, the letter U in Omkara, which again means exclusive, exclusive service, right, um, uh, came ahead, came ahead because the obstacles. Right, so the first part of the last part of the first part of the Shesha, the, the after Omkara, the last part of the, of the Astakshara Mantra, the first part of it is Nama. So why does that come first? Because in Omkara we get A, which means Narayana, but in the rest of it we get Nama, so which means not me, right, or servitorship, or exclusive servitorship to the Supreme. So why does that come? The Namaha explains the Ukara comes ahead because the obstacles such as I and mine, the ahankara and the mamakara, the possessiveness and the ego of the jiva, right, have to be removed first before experiencing him. We cannot experience God directly without the removal of our ahankara our, 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 and, our, and our mamakara, our I and mine, uh, ego and possessiveness. Right, so it's very important. So that's why Namo Narayanaya is much greater than the Omkara, because the Omkara doesn't include that coming first. And that has to come first, that understanding, that understanding that we are exclusively meant to serve him and we're exclusively his servants. That has to come first without, otherwise we don't experience in Lord Narayana uh, in the proper way, right? Even if we had an experience of Lord Narayana, even if we had an experience of God, right? If, we, if we're just experiencing God as something, somebody we can make a deal with, that we do something and he gives us something back, that is not the correct way, right? Because that would be that we want something. We, we have possessiveness and we have ego, that we want something out of our relationship with Srimad Narayana, whereas with, through, the let, through the word Namaha, we give that up. We give up the fruits of our actions and only after giving that up and realizing that we, that we don't have those fruits or we can't have those fruits, can we therefore experience Lord Narayana correctly for what he is, for what he is, is our complete master and controller and supporter and protector, right? Beyond just going to him and asking him for something because when we surrender to him totally, 
as his slave and, and give up even any sort of self-serve, self-serving attitude, right? That's the proper way to experience God. Okay, so it's, it's very, very, very much better than in the way it's explained in the Omkara, in the order of, of, of the Omkara, that Namo Narayanaya is a much better order. Um, okay, so in the Pranava, there is an order uh, of which the Akara, Ukara, and then Makara, so the A, U, and M, right, in that order. If the mantra Shesham, meaning the rest of the mantra, Namo Narayana, explains the Pranava, right, why uh, should it not also follow this same order? That's a question. That is, the Narayana part, the Narayana part that explains the Akara should come first. So it should be, instead of Om Namo Narayanaya, it should be Om Narayanaya Namaha. Right? We've also heard that too. Om Namo Om Narayanaya Namaha, Om Keshavaya Namaha, Om Narayanaya Namaha, Om Madhavaya Namaha. We hear that very often. People say that. They use it in Puja and Archana, they say Om, then they say the name of the deity in the dative case, and then they say Namaha at the end. So why is it important that the Namaha doesn't come at the end? Why is it important the Namaha comes before and not after Narayana? That's the important point. The reason is as follows. Through the Narayan, though the, the, the Narayan part, which explains the Akara, the letter A, right? The letter A means Narayana. Right, it, it, uh, uh, get, uh, one gets Bhagavat Anubhava. Bhagavat Anubhava. It gets he, one gets um, understanding of our uh, Bhagavat Anubhava means a uh, uh, Shakshatkara. Bhagavat Anubhava means uh, um, an experience of the Lord, an experience of the Lord. Right, when the obstacles to this experience, which are Ahamkara and Mamakara, which means egoism and and uh, possessiveness, self-possessiveness, right? These are the obstacles, right? Right. As the removal of these, these through the through the word namo, will lead to uh, bhagavat bhagavat anubhava, more relationship with the Lord being good, being proper, right? It is appropriate that the namaha should come first. It's absolutely appropriate that the namaha should come first, right? Just as a bee is removed before the honey is taken, right? So if you if you go to a honey hive and you and you and you go to grab some honey and you take that honey first and you try to eat it, then you'll be stung if you if you if you take the bees along with the honey when you try to eat it. So therefore, get rid of the bees first. What do they do? Bee- beekeepers do. They take a smoke gun and they smoke the hive and the bees all don't like the smoke and they leave and then they can collect the honey without them being stung by the bees, right? So if we go to Sriman Narayana, similarly, if we go to Sriman Narayana to make some deal or to get something like that, we don't get the proper, we're not going to get the proper uh, relationship with him correctly, right? If we go with ego, if we go with possessiveness, right, to the Lord, we can approach the Lord in that way. But that's not the proper way to do it. The proper way to have the proper uh, experience of the Lord is to, first of all, give up that ego and to give up the possessiveness. And that comes from the word namo, namaha, not me. Right. As the, as the removal of 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 these through the word namo will lead to the Bhagavad Anubhavam being good or being correct, right? It's appropriate that Namaha be ahead, be ahead of Narayanaya, be before Narayanaya, right? And he, and he gives this example of, uh, of the bee, removing bees from the honey before you take the honey. It's a good example. So to the word Namaha or namo, the obstacles are removed through saying that I, it's not mine, it's not me, it's not for me, and it's not mine, namaha, right? The obstacles are removed. That is what we call virodi, something which is, which is stopping us from having the, the real uh, relationship with the Supreme Lord. What is stopping us is false ego, uh, possessiveness. It's our uh, uh, hankara, mamakara, I, inus and minus, right? So that once that is removed by namo, Right? then we can have the proper relationship through, um, 
So what is he saying? The obstacles are removed and through the Narayanaya, the honey, which is the, uh, the experience of the Lord is taken. So that's really nice. Very, very nice. So let's go back to, um, to the text. Sutra number 78. Sutra number 78 speaks now. Okay, so next we're going to talk about the word Namaha itself. First of all, we've understood that, first of all, we've understood that the Shesha, the rest of the mantra, Namo Narayanaya, is an elaboration of Omkar. Then we had a question as to why it's in a different, why the, the subjects of the different parts of Omkara and Namo Narayanaya are in different order. Now we understood from this, it's very, very important that Namaha comes before Narayanaya, right? That was a, what we just understood. So now that we've understood uh, the, the why everything has to be in, this, in, a certain, in the certain order that it's in, now let's dis, dis, discuss the Shesha, the Namo Narayanaya and its parts one by one and divide them up and understand them um, completely. So. The first part of that is to understand the first word, Namaha, or Namo, right? So, uh, so number 78 says Namaha, or Namas, right, or Namo, right, is two words. It's made up of two words, Na and Maha. Na and Maha. So Na means not, and Maha means myself. So what is the meaning of these two words? And let's go on for a second. 79. The Maha says one belongs to oneself, mine. And the na negates that, so it means not. Maha is the sixth case genitive. Six mean, uh, uh, ma means um, the genitive case or possessive case, right, of the, the personal pronoun. Uh, so so it, means, it, it means of myself, of myself. Maha means of myself. Uh, ending on the letter M, right? So uh, the sixth case ending in Sanskrit is of, of nouns is asya. So therefore the letter M in Omkara could be, could be understood as masya, whereas the letter A is aya. The letter M could be masya. But of course it's not, uh, it's the last part of a, of, if we consider the Omkara to be a compound, it's the last part. So it should actually have an ending on it, but it doesn't. So uh, what they're saying here is that we, we think we can think of this, uh, this word Namaha, we can think of the, uh, of the, of the, le of it broken up into two words. The second, uh, the second word is, is like, is like Mama, which is the, which is, which means of me or of mine or mine. Yeah. Of me, mine. So it means mine, right? What belongs to me, mine. I and mine. So thus it shows that the soul indicated by the letter ma, right, is self-purposed or swa, swa, swarta, swartatwa, swartatwa, has the purpose of itself, has the purpose of itself, has its own purpose, is self-serving, right? The opposite of the aforementioned quality of being for the purpose of another which is tadartya, tadartya, for him. So he's for himself. Maha means mama, for myself. And it's the opposite of being for the Lord, right? Tadartya, right? Therefore, it says one belongs to oneself. But this is not true. One doesn't belong to oneself. One is the property of the Lord. Right? If you're the property of the Lord, you're not the property of yourself. Right? You're a slave of the Lord. The na indicates negation and excludes that. So the reason we put na before ma is to exclude the ego, to exclude the possessiveness, to exclude the idea of I and mine. Putting together the meaning stated in both ways, right? He says. Thus, Namaha means one does not belong to oneself. One does not belong to oneself. One doesn't belong to anybody else either. It's exclusively, one belongs only exclusively to Sriman Narayana. Rather than stating the meaning of Na Maha, 
in the order of the words, it has been stated in reverse order. This is because, right? So, okay, so in the explanation, in the, in the sutra here, look in 79, in the sutra, first of all, the first thing in sutra 78, he says, okay, what is namaha? What is namo? If we divide it in two, it's two words, it's na and it's maha. Na and maha. Okay, now what did Naha and Maha explain? First of all, he explains Maha. Then he explains Na. Why does he do it in that order in Sutra 79? He does it in that order for a reason. The reason he does it uh, is because, the reason he does it is because we start off by thinking ignorantly, wrongly, because of, because of uh, lack of knowledge, that we, we, that we are our own, uh, self-serving beings, that we belong to ourselves, that we exist for our own purposes. So that's why, he's, that's why he explains maha first. Then he comes along and explains na and, and negates that. So this is because uh, one must explain the thing prohibited. One should explain the thing prohibited and then make the prohibition. Right. If you really want somebody to understand a rule, right, you don't just say to them, don't smoke. You explain to them why smoking is bad. And then you say, don't do it. Right. So here, the idea is to explain mamakara, explain ahankara and mamakara, uh, egoness and, uh, and iness or possessiveness and explain how it's wrong. And then say, now don't do it, give it up, right? Okay, so uh, first of all, we should explain the thing prohibited and then make the prohibition. When said in order, uh, as in relinquish everything, right? Which is uh, a quote from Tiruvai Moli uh, 121 in the, in the purple, we could, we could look at Tiruvai Moli 151, one, sorry, 121. Uh, it must be composed so as to state the prohibition before the thing prohibited, right? So in, in Tirvai Moli, uh, one, two, one, it's stated in a different way. This Pila Lokacharya has also explained in another, in another work called Parantapi. Parantapi. Parantapati, excuse me. Parantapati, 136. So uh, Parantapati, Parantapati is another one of the 18 uh, Rahasya Granthas or Astadasa Rahasyams of Pile Lokacharya. And uh, uh, non exact quotation. So, so we do have an edition of that, which is printed in 1911. So we could possibly see that if we want to go into further elaboration of how Pile Lokacharya has explained how Namalwar in Tiruvai Moli 121 uh, uses the term relinquish everything and gives it in a different, in a different order than is given in the Astakshara Mantra. But anyhow, that's just an aside. Manavala Mamani is just mentioning that, that we could go and look at this other work and we could also understand it from a different point of view. So continuing on the letter U, right? Which again means exclusivity in the Omkara prohibits subservience to others means exclusively the services for Srimad Narayana, saying one does not belong to oneself or to others. One does not belong to oneself. And one also does not belong to others apart from Srimad Narayana. So the exclusivity is there for him as the master. Uh, if this namaha, namas or namo, right, word namo, elaborates the letter U, why has it been explained as saying only one does not belong to oneself and not that one does not, not also that one does not belong to others. Okay, so that's going to be explained here now. But the very first important, remember, the first thing that we explain, the primary explanation usually is, the, is, is given first. So the primary explanation is given first that one does not belong to oneself. Why? Because the false ego is so strong in this material world that we should first understand that we do not belong to ourselves. Now, 
somebody may in this material world believe that they don't exist for their own satisfaction or for their own self-service, but they may think that they have to serve their country or their uh, or humanity or well, they may they may be altruistic. They may have some some ideas like that. That also has to be um, that notion has to be destroyed um, if one wants to to relate to the supreme person in, in the proper way. Okay. So first of all, he's giving that primary understanding, and then this will be dealt with in the in the next sutras. So let's go back and let's just see what PB and Angacharya has to say about about these uh, seventy eight to eighty. Uh, th those those aspects that we understood here. So uh, again, to we're talking about the word namo now, of which is part of the last part of the Tira Mantra, and so uh, Sutra seventy eight says that uh, namaha or namo is broken up into two parts, na and maha. In uh, in order to show the meaning of namaha. Part, uh, the Namaha part of the end of Tira Mantra, it's broken up further into two parts, right? Uh, and that is Na and Ma. So that's very, very, very simple. So then continuing on with 79 and 80, which are grouped together, right? Uh, the sutras say, through Maha, it is said that one belongs to the, that, that, it, that it belongs to the self. Maha means that I belong to myself. Maha means mama, means of me, by me, of me, uh, mine. It means mine. Through the naha is shown that it should that this should be rejected. So the word na is a rejection, is a is is a is a is a is a prefix that is put on maha to show that that minus or or I and mine or egotism and and uh, and possessiveness self-possessiveness has to be rejected, right? So then sutra number 80, together with namaha or namo, the word namo, shows that it does not belong to the self. It does not belong to the self. So the, so Pibhyanangachari says, the meanings of na and maha parts are shown. Maha uh, is, is the makara or the letter M in omkara, which represents the soul, Right with a six case ending, or other words, mama, in Sanskrit that's called mama or mine, or of me, which is the meaning mine, correct. Therefore, it carries the idea that I belong to myself. With the naha, that idea is rejected, and together it means that I do not belong to myself. Let's see in this in the in the next mantra. Does he talk about? Uh, okay, so we'll go back and see text 81. Okay, so we understood that. Uh, text number 81. When one belongs to another, in other words, the Lord, uh, when one belongs to another, the Lord can... Sorry, when, other, when one belongs to another, the Lord can redeem him by demonstrating his own distinctive excellence. Okay, so if one doesn't believe that he belongs to himself, but he believes that he belongs to another. So he may believe that he belongs to the king. He may believe that he belongs to, to others. And in order to, in order to dispel that, what the Lord can do is simply show that he's the greatest master amongst all the different masters, and then one will think, oh no, I, I, I belong to the Lord. When the Chaitana or the soul says that he is his own, even the possibility of redemption is destroyed. So when we have that false ego, that, that ahankara and mamakara, right? I and mine, that idea of I and mine, like that, there is no possibility of redemption, right? But if we, if we don't have that, if we, if we give up that, first of all, through the use of the word namaha or namo, right? By negating the inus and minus, right? Then there's a possibility of redemption, even if we think that we belong to others, that we're the servants of others, like the, like the king or the, the, the country or the family or the friends, even if we serve others. But the Lord can redeem us 
if we're in that situation, as long as we don't have Inus and Minus, by simply showing that he's the greatest master. As long as one is a shesha of another, since he's agreeable to subservience, right? So when you say that I am, I am, uh, when you think about I and mine, you're saying I don't serve anybody else but myself, right? If I, if I say like that, then it means I'm not agreeable to service and service is the primary uh, aspect or attribute of the soul. Once we agree to service, once we understand that we are a servant, even if we don't think that we're a servant of the Supreme Lord, we are redeemable. We are savable. Once we understand that we're a servant, even if we think that we're a servant of society or a servant of our family or a servant of, of the king or a servant of our society or a servant of humanity, even if we think like that, right? Still, because we have that basic understanding that we're a servant, right? We can be redeemed. But if we never agree that we're a servant, we can never be redeemed, right? So as long as one is a shesha, a servant of another, since he is agreeable and not oneself, right? And since he's agreeable to servitorship or subservience, the Lord can redeem him from that state by showing him the Lord's own excellence in comparison to others, right? If you agree that you're a servant, why not serve the best master? That will be the, that's be the point, the Lord showing him to be, himself to be the best master, right? In comparison to others, as a cause of all, Sarvakarna, he's the cause of all. He's the savior of all, the Sarvarakshaka, right? And he's the master of all, the Sarvasheshi. So he, he's the protector of all, right? He's, he's everything, right? So he has these, these um, qualities. So therefore, he shows that he's the best master. So anybody who is even willing to be a servant of anything, of anybody, right, of any cause, right, would want to serve the best master. So that person is redeemable. But when the chaitana, when the soul firmly takes the position that he belongs to himself, if the Lord says, you are mine, he will not agree to the subservience, but will counter with, I am my own. Thus, there will not be even the capacity for redemption, right? What is the role played by namas? To this he says, so we'll go on to that. So there's going to be uh, an explanation here in the footnote uh, 137, right? Uh, it, he actually gives um, something called from, from the mukta, muk Daka, Mukdaka Sloka, attributed to Parasura Bhatta. So Parasura Bhatta, again, uh, one of the two twin sons of Kuresh or Kuritalwan, one of the, who was the closest, um, the greatest disciple of Sri Ramanuja, right? And he was one of the Acharyas in the Guru Prampara. He has written some, some things. And in, in that, he has written uh, some slokas in the form of a dialogue that explains this between the Lord and the soul. So this is his idea. He wrote a dialogue between the Lord and the soul. And the dialogue is like this. The Lord says, you are mine to the soul. The soul says, I am my own. I'm not yours. I'm my own. The Lord says, on what basis? On what basis do you say that you're your, that you're your own? The soul says, uh, and on what basis is your position? So the soul counters, right? You know, with a question with a question, back to the Lord. And the Lord says, by the authority of the Vedas, by the authority of the Vedas, I say, you're mine. The soul says, and my position is based upon experience from time immemorial. From time immemorial in this material world, he's been going through different births. And in each case, he's been trying to serve himself, right? Uh, and the Lord says, but that has been refuted. That has been refuted. He's refuted. Then, uh, then the soul says, where's the refutation? Whose is it, is it? Whose refutation is it, right? 
And the Lord says, mine, lay down in the Gita and the other Shastras. I've refuted this in the Gita and the other Shastras. The soul says, who is the witness to this matter? Who is the witness to this matter? The Lord says, a learned man will be the witness, the pundit, the pundit, the, the intelligent, the jnani. He's the, he's the witness to this. And the soul says, alas, that person will be partial. He will be on your side. So how can we trust that person, right? He's on your side. So to say that, to, you know, to explain, to agree to this interpretation of yours, right? Uh, thus, this is the quarrel. Uh, the quarrel, the Lord. Uh, uh, thus, in this quarrel, the uh, Lord. Thus, in this quarrel, Lord, you're in search of an arbitrator, right? So the Lord has this quarrel going on with the fallen souls. And it goes on like this. And he says, no, I have proof. I have proof that you're mine. It's there in the scriptures. And the soul continues to say, well, okay, you, yeah, but who, who's to say that? Who's to say that? that? That's the people who say that, they are the pundits of the scriptures, those people are on your side of, of the argument like that. So you need some sort of arbiter there. So anyway, this is, a, this is given in the footnote. And it's an interesting discussion that was uh, that is attributed to Parasha Bhatta, that he wrote about this whole idea of mamakara and ahankara, of uh, possessiveness or minus and inus, uh, and uh, and so to 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 try to get us to understand that since time immemorial the souls in this world have thought like this, and the Lord is trying to convince them otherwise, uh, and they have to become convinced of that otherwise they can't be redeemed. They cannot be redeemed, right? Once they, once they accept that they are servants and they can even serve something else in this material world, they become much easier to redeem. But when they think that they are self-serving only for themselves like that uh, and being very, very um, selfish, right? Let's say, right? Then they can never be redeemed. So continue on with uh, uh, text uh, 81. When one belongs to another, the Lord can redeem him by demonstrating his own ex, uh, distinctive excellence. When the chaitana or the, or the soul says he is his own. Oh, we did that already. Okay. It is his own. Even the possibility of redemption is destroyed. So now what, what is the role played by this namas, by this letter, uh, this word namo? To this he says uh, in text 82, it gets rid of obstruction it gets rid of obstruction what we call in sanskrit the virodi that which is stopping you from being liberated that that thing which is stopping stopping you so uh in this obstruction is this obstruction one or many uh he says that the obstructions are three okay so we're going to go into the obstructions just now but let's see what Hibi and Angacharya says about um, Text 81, uh, text 81 and text 82. So again, uh, text 81, if a person becomes enslaved to another, then it's possible to show him the difference between others and the Lord and to correct him and say, look, here's the best master. You should serve this master. That's the Supreme Lord. If he's enslaved only to himself, living as I and mine, it's difficult to bring him to the right path. Therefore, it can be taken that the removal of anya sheshatum or servitorship to others is connected with the removal of swa sheshatum or servitorship to himself, which is shown in uh, the word namaha or namo. So previously it was told that the word namaha explains the letter U in Omkara. Also that the letter U in Omkara uh, removes being enslaved to others other than himself, uh, other than him, the Supreme Lord, excuse me, which includes the removal of being enslaved to oneself. If the Namaha explains the letter U, then, it, 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 then can it stop at stating that one, can it stop at stating that one does not belong to oneself? Should it, should it also not show that one does not belong to others. Yes, of course, it's true. 
between uh, Anya Sheshatram and Swa Sheshatram, in other words, in be, uh, between the idea of being enslaved to others and being enslaved to oneself, right? It is being enslaved to oneself, which is more dangerous. If a person is enslaved to another, it means that the person is agreeable to that idea then it's easy for him to show this person the, the Supreme Lord's divine qualities and the difference between him and others and to enslave him to the Supreme Lord. When a person becomes enslaved to himself, it is difficult to correct him and make him enslaved to the Lord. Therefore, uh, as Swashe Shatam Nivriti, or getting rid of the getting rid of the idea of being enslaved to oneself is more important than Anya Sheshat Shatra Nivriti or getting rid of the idea of being enslaved to others. It has been shown, it, it, is, it is that which is shown primarily in the in the in the in Namaha, not me, right? Directly. And continuing on, right, we have three more. Um, Three more sutras here. Uh, first of all, let's go and see uh, up to 84 and the other text. Right, so we were, we discussed uh, up to 83, where we said that there, um, this gets rid, the Namaha gets rid of an obstruction. What obstruction does it get? It gets rid of three obstructions, right? And the three obstructions are what? Right, these three obstructions are, number one, obstruction to the soul's essential nature, Swarupa. So what we call Swarupa Virodhi. Swarupa Virodhi means the obstruction of not understanding the primary essential nature of the soul, which is servitorship to the Supreme Lord only. That is the primary essential nature of the soul. And therefore that, if we don't understand that, that is a Virodhi, that is an obstruction. That's the first obstruction. The second obstruction is the obstruction to the means. The obstruction to the means. What is the means? The means is the Lord. The Lord himself is the means to moksha, right? He's the means and also the goal. So that is also uh, upaya virodi, or the obstruction to the means. And the obstruction to the goal of prapya, the, goal, the Lord is also the goal. He's also the means, he's also the goal. So that, the, uh, that is called the prapya virodi, the obstruction to the goal. So what are the three obstructions? The three obstructions are the obstructions to the soul's essential nature, Swarupa Virodhi, the obstructions to the means, to liberation, Upaya Virodhi, and the obstruction to the goal or prop, which is the supreme service of the Supreme Lord in, in, in uh, Sri Vaikuntha, Moksha. That is the Prapya Virodhi, right? So these are the three Virodhis or the three obstructions. And this Namaha destroys those three destroys those three. How does it destroy those three? That we're going to see. This refers to, number one, the obstruction of the soul's true nature referred to in the first word, right? The, the pranava, right? Two, the obstruction to the means that is implied by the word namaha or namo, right? And three, the obstruction to the goal, which is stated in the last word, narayana, narayanaya. Narayanaya means not just narayana, but it means service to narayana which is the goal, right? So um, this namas or namaha or namo uh, on, on the analogy of the crow's eyes looks in both directions. Okay, so the, what he's saying is the word naro, uh, namaha or namo here looks in both directions. It applies to both parts of the mantra, the, the first part, omkara, and the last part, narayanaya. Thus, it will remove the obstacle of the soul's essential nature, Swarupa, and to the goal, Prapya, as stated in the first and last words. First and last words. Uh, according to the Indian folk belief, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the footnote 138, the crow has only one eyeball which shifts uh, from side to side to look in each direction. This analogy, illustrates how namas, which removes obstacles, can look towards the pranava at the beginning of the mantra, which teaches the nature of the swarupa, the essential nature of the soul, right? And towards the narayanaya, which is the other, the end of the mantra, right? Which refers to the goal. What is the goal again? 
service to Sriman Narayana. Not just Narayana, but service to Sriman Narayana. Narayan, Aya, right? Aya means two or four, the dative case. So just what is the removal of these three ob obstructions, right? He reveals this sequence in the following three sentences. And first of all, we'll go to PB and under try and we'll see what he has to say about these three sutras. Okay, so once again, very easy. 82, 83, 84, the first one, 82. With the namaha or namo, obstacles are removed, right? Again, it, the main obstacle is our own minus and minus our ego and our uh, possessiveness, right? So nama, not myself, not, not of me, right? Then, then there are th the, the obstacles are removed. Now, the question is, after you say obstacles are removed, it means uh, what obstacles, right? Then, the, then 83 simply says there are three. There are three obstacles, okay? 84 says what those obstacles are. Again, what are they? They are Swarupa Virodhi, Upaya Virodhi, and Prapya Virodhi. Swarupa Virodhi means, the Virodhi means obstacles, means obstruction, a blockage, something which stops you from attaining the goal. Why does uh, a misunderstanding of your Swarupa, of what you actually are, you're actually a servant of only Sriman Narayana. That is your primary status as a, as a Jiva, right? As a soul, right? to know anything else than that, to think that you're a servant of yourself or to think that you're a servant of others is a virodhi, is an obstruction to that. And that is called Swarupa virodhi. Upaya virodhi means a, an obstruction to what, knowing what is the means, what is the means, to not understand the means, the means is the Supreme Lord. And to not understand that service to the Supreme Lord is the means, to not understand that is an obstruction. And propya virodhi to, to not understand that that the goal the goal to be attained right these are all tattva kita and purusharta remember those three things right so swarupa virodhi is tattva virodhi right paya virodhi is hita virodhi prapya virodhi is purusharta virodhi same thing right these are the same things over and over again they're being explained in different with different words in just slightly different ways the prapya virodhi is the the, the obstruction of the goal so the Namaha obstructs the goals, uh, 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 removes the obstacles, which are of three types. They are Swarupa Virodhi, Upaya Virodhi, and Prapya Virodhi. The Swarupam, or, or the essential nature of the soul, was gathered out of the Pranava, or the Omkara, right? And the obstacle to that is called Swarupa Virodhi. It means being born out of, uh, it mean, uh, the means is born, the means, or Upaya, is born out of the word Nama, right? And, so, and therefore the obstacle, the means, right? What is the means to attain the Lord? That is by giving up the ego and the possessiveness, right? And, and realizing the essential swarupa, right? So the means is the, the nama, the nama is clearing the obstacle, right? And therefore that, uh, that, that obstacle uh, is called, that is a paya virodhi. The goal is described by Narayanaya. So these three words, om namo Narayanaya, om, describes the Swarupa. Nama describes the Upaya, the means. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, Narayanaya describes the goal, service to Sriman Narayana, right? So that is the, uh, the Upaya. The Upaya is the Namaha. The Upaya is uh, that Virodhi. Yeah, okay. Uh, it is shown uh, before that the Tira Mantra explains uh, the Swarupam, Upaya, and Purusharta. Right, so all of these three virodis, the, the namas removes the, from those obstacles. The swarupam, which is sheshatvam or servitorship, has the ahankara mamakara obstacles, the ego and the and the the minus and minus uh, and possessiveness uh, obstacles. The upaya, which is looking to no one but him, only looking to him, has the obstacle which is the belief that the self can be protected by itself, that it's for itself, right? That is, that is removed by the word namo, right? The purushartam, which is service to him, right? Has the obstacle that the jiva derives pleasure from its own, from, uh, for itself in that service, 
uh, the obstacle that the jiva derives pleasure for itself in that service. Okay. So how does Namaha remove these obstacles? It's, it is told by Sri Parashara, but the in Astasloki, and he gives a quotation here, the Namaha or the Namo joins with the parts before and after, right? And he gives the Nyaya of the Kaka, Kaka Chi Nyaya, the, the Nyaya of the crow, the, the logic of the crow that can look from both sides. The Namaha looks to, the, to destroy, it destroys not only the Upaya Virodhi, the obstacles in understanding the essential nature from the omkara and destroys the its own uh, obstacle of the I and my possessiveness in in, uh, in namaha, and it also destroys the obstacles to attaining the service of Sriman Narayana, which is understood by the word Narayanaya, because it looks back and forth uh, to all parts, right and also stays by itself and removes the three Virodhis, joining with the part before uh, it becomes Om Namaha, joining with the part after it becomes Narayanaya Namaha, but it's, uh, by itself it becomes Namo Namaha. So all of these, all of these three ways uh, is, uh, are given here. So continuing back to the main part, so, I mean, one other question, if I may, yes. or we are running out of time. Yeah, you know, the, the, you know, when we ask or when, when we hear about surrender, uh, we are not, how, where does the Guru and Acharya stand? Because we surrender and, you know, we sub, submit ourselves to Acharya and Guru. Where, where does that, how does that relate? Or is that yeah. out of context? Now, if we, when we were studying Sri Vachanabhushna, in Sri Vachanabhushna, which is normally studied after Mumushapati, it describes that first. The first thing that somebody does is they get they they begin to think they begin to think that they should control the mind and body. So right, the, they get this idea to control the mind and body. When they control the senses, then the Lord sends them an acharya, and the acharya comes, and the, the acharya gives them the the astakshara mantra. He gives them gives them all the mantras, but he gives them the astakshara mantra. Um, and the Astakshara Mantra is the preliminary cause of moksha, is the preliminary uh, means is to moksha. It's a preliminary. It's not the primary means. The primary means is the Lord himself. The Lord himself is the primary upaya or means to moksha. He himself is the primary means. But the, through under, then through understanding, the, the Acharya is going to teach you the meaning of the of the Astakshara Mantra. The meaning of the Astakshara Mantra is going to give you the first, first and foremost, the most important understanding that you have to have is the understanding of your true nature or your swarupa. Once you understand that you're a servant, so first thing you have to understand that you're a servant, right? When you give up the idea of serving yourself, right? And you think I am meant for serving others, right? That's the first step. Second step. Right. Second step is giving up serving others, but serving only the Supreme Lord, only the Supreme Lord. Now, serving only the Supreme Lord in uh, Sri Vachanabhushana also in Mokshapati also it explains, right, that that doesn't mean excluding the Guru, excluding other Vaishnavas or excluding Mahalakshmi or excluding other Nitya Suris or other great Acharyas or other um, consorts or associates of the Lord, right? Anybody who is in relationship to the Lord, they also get, uh, get contained within that idea of serving the Lord, right? Just as in the same way, when you have a servant in your house and you engage the servant, your wife gives, um, you know, your wife will give um, orders to the servant. Or your, even your children might give orders to the servant. Everybody in the family gives orders to the servant. The servant does whatever the family wants even though he's been employed by the head of the household. So there are two things. There is Bhagavat, Bhagavat Sheshatva, where we are service to God, and Bhagavata Sheshatva, we have service to the other Bhagavatas, the others, those who are in associates, associated with God, right? His consorts, his, his associates, his servants, his, uh, his acharyas, the alwars, you know, your guru, your other Vaishnavas, right, basically. And so, so these all come under this idea of exclusive service to the Supreme Lord. 
right? These all, anybody else is not exclusive service to the Supreme Lord. And especially the most important, the most, most dangerous idea is to simply be self-serving, minus and minus. Right, so that's explained. That's explained. That's the Swarupa Virodhi to, that, that, that keeps us from, from, from attaining. So the first thing is the guru is going to explain to you the Astakshara Mantra. So when the guru explains to you the Astakshara Mantra, he's going to explain that. And so you're going to know, first of all, the first thing you're going to go is Tattva. What is Tattva? Tattva means truth and principle. The truth is that you are a servant only to the Supreme Lord. That is the truth. So that's the first truth you have to know. If you know that, then you're halfway there. Okay, second thing, right, he's going to explain to you is what is the means then? So, okay, now I know I have to only serve the Supreme Lord. Now, what is the means for me to go from where I am now to the goal? And what is the goal? The guru is going to explain to you from the Astakshara Mantra, the goal. The goal is service to the Supreme Lord. And the guru is going to engage you in the service of the Supreme Lord and also of the associates of the Lord. He's going to engage you in that service, right? So he's going to explain to you the goal and how to get to the goal. So that's the Purusharta is the goal. And he's going to explain to the, the Upaya or the Hita, right? The means to the goal. The means is the Lord himself is the means. So the guru is going to explain that all to you, but he has to give you the mantra first. He gives you the mantra and he explains to you the mantra. When you understand the mantra, the meaning of the mantra, then you actually engage in the service of the Lord and the, and the other, you know, associates of the Lord, right? Bhagavat Sheshatva and Bhagavata Sheshatva. And that is moksha right there. That is moksha, basically. Uh, of course, we still have to leave this body and go to Sri Vaikuntha and everything like that. But until this body falls, we engage in Bhagavat and Bhagavata Sheshatva, the service of the Lord and his devotees, like that. So the, the mantra is there to explain that all to you. The mantra is there to get you in thinking in the right way and to understand what is my tattva, what is my hita, and what is my purushaka. When you know what your status is, what your, what your goal is, and what, what the means to the goal is, and what is the things, the obstacles stopping you from the goal, when you know all those things, then you can... Then you, then you then you will be liberated. You you the Lord will liberate you at the time of death. So the acharya is there as a representative of Mahalakshmi, like as a mediator, as a mediator in between you and God. He's there to deliver God to you in the form of the Astakshara Mantra, right, and to explain it to you, and to engage you in proper thinking and proper action. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so, so that's, that's the thing. So that's why I always tell people is, is yeah, Om Namo Narayana is a nice mantra and you can chant Om Namo Narayana and you can pray for wealth and you can pr pray for, you know, progeny and you can pray for whatever you want. Right. Um, and still it will work, but at the same time, that's not the true meaning of Om Namo Narayana. The true meaning of Om Namo Narayana only comes from studying books like the Moksha Party. This is the esoteric internal meaning. So people have this idea, we just worship Lord Narayana and we get whatever we want like that by chanting Om Namo Narayana. That's a very yeah. superficial way of doing it. So we go yeah, to so the Guru. Yeah, so Guru Abhishek to... sponsors Homa and stuff. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right. Yeah, but the, you know, depends on why we're doing it. Why are we doing the Homa? Why are we doing the Abhishek? Why are we doing all these pujas of Sri Narayana? Why are we chanting Japa of Om Namo Narayana? Why? Right? The ultimate reason is to understand the meaning. The meaning is so important. There's two things with a mantra, right? The first thing is, the, is, is that we can use the mantra. We can use the mantra for japa. We can use the mantra for homa. We can use the mantra for puja. We can use the mantra in, in, in different ways. And we can try to attain the fruits of the mantra. But the, the most important thing is what is the meaning? What's the meaning of the mantra? There's an external meaning. And then there's an internal meaning. There's a very, very esoteric meaning. And that's why after, after the Acharya gives the mantra to somebody, he then teaches them the esoteric meaning of the mantra in books like Mamukshapati, different Rahasya Granthas. These were taught. And uh, maybe they weren't taught to everybody who gets the mantra. Maybe everybody wasn't interested. Maybe everybody was, maybe some people were just interested in using the mantra superficially. 
like and and they weren't interested in deeply going into the meaning of the mantra but the acharya is there to teach the deep meaning of the mantra and that's the most important thing and that's the thing which is most most useful about the mantra because what what does it say in the scriptures in the scriptures it says in narayana Upanishad, it says om namo narayanayati mantra pasakaha vaikuntha bhuvana lokam gamishiti he he will go that person gamishiti will go in the future he will go to Sri Vaikuntha, if he worships Upasakaha, he worships the mantra. It doesn't mean if he just chants the mantra. It doesn't say if he chants this mantra, he'll go to, to Vaikuntha. No, not just if you chant it, if you understand it. If you understand it and you live it and, 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 you, under, and you take note of what it actually means, the esoteric meaning of it, then you'll go. Then you'll go to Sri Vaikuntha. Okay, Upaska, one who worships it. It is the Supreme Lord embodied in a mantra. And to worship, we have to worship of it with our manas, with our intelligence, with our mind. We have to worship it. We have to understand its inner meaning, its deep esoteric meaning. Then and then only can we go. As it was said, there's no redemption for somebody who is self serving. So you can certainly get a mantra. You can get even Omni Monarayanaya mantra from somebody. But you can still be self-serving. You can still be consumed by service to others, like your family, your friends, your country, your humanity, right? Or, or just to yourself. And you will not go. You will not go to Sri Vaikuntha because you have not un, you have not given up I and mine. You have not Namaha, not me. Yeah. So first of all, give up I and mine, possessiveness, egoness. And then second of all, give up subservience to others who are not associated with Sriman Narayana. And then take wholeheartedly to the service of Sriman Narayana and his associates, right? Those associated with him. And the guru will help us to do all those things. And in that way, we are worshipping Sriman Narayana, worshipping him, actually worshipping the meaning of the mantra, worshipping the mantra. Nam namo narayanayati mantra pasakaha. Upasakaha. Then Vaikuntha Lokam, Bhuvana Lokam, Yumishiti. That is the way. So the meaning is much more important than just chanting number of times, thousands of millions of times, like that, without meaning or simply. You understand? Yes, beautiful. Yeah, thanks. So I think we'll uh, leave it there uh, today. Um, I, I'm very excited about this particular part because it's very, very clear. It becomes very clear what the what the nature. See, you see that Omnimona Rayanaya, not just Omkara, everything is there in Omkara. Right? But when we see the whole mantra, it becomes more clear when it's elaborated. It becomes more clear the diff, by understanding the different parts of the rest of the mantra, it becomes more clear exactly what our nature is, exactly what our relationship with, with the Supreme Lord is exactly what his, his he, how he is going to be the means and exactly what the goal is. So these Tattva Hita and Purusharta, these things are, become much more clear. So we have this uh, Arta Panchikam, right? Out of which we talk about three Tattva Hita and Purusharta. So we also have the Virodhi, we also have the obstacles. Um, so all of this becomes much, much clearer when we go into, into depth into the into the depth of these things like some of these teachings were in the beginning of the Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya they were secret teachings which were not even given to all the initiates they were only handed down from uh, to one person like this but they were written down at a certain point for fear of losing them because this is the the essence this is the internal esoteric understanding and it's so so important to understand it so Thank you very much. And uh, if there's any other questions for, for, on today's topics uh, or, or what we've talked about before also, or anything. Otherwise, I think- we'll Asami, just, we can leave it there. the ultimate thing is to understand the meaning of the mantra, which you have very much made clear and expounded in this class. But even if someone by, you know, the, a lot of Sri Vaishnavas, they're just traditional and they just take Samashrayanam and they don't really get into the deep meanings and they chant the mantra and they practice. Of course, they will also get moksha because, you know, they are serving Shri Manarayana, isn't it? And 
they right. are chanting the mantra even though they don't know the deepest depth or or, with you, or you have a you have a lot of people you have a lot of people they take they do some ashram when they're young like that and then they've got their whole business life ahead of them their whole life their family life and everything and they do so many things and then later on when they retire you know again like the water glides, they'll do baranyasam and then they'll start off the baranyas and start reading start reading the books of the acharyas and start reading the deep start studying the deep meanings and everything like that but we can't know in this material world we can't know when we're going to die you know so it's important for us to to understand these things um as soon as possible it's, it's very very important as soon as possible to understand these things and don't put it off it, there's a there's a tendency amongst traditional followers of sri vaishnavism to put it off to put off the deep study of these subjects and to and to go through the motions uh you know the social motions of taking some shrine and just you know why a woman takes some shrine and right after she's married just so that she can prepare food in the house and it can be offered to the deity in the house without some shrine and she can't do that like that so it becomes a necessity to take some shrine but necessity is not just to take some shrine the summer shrine the, the, the tapta mudras and all these things these are just externals like that the necessity is the internals the necessity is the internals some of the uh, gajendra draupadi vibhishana they didn't do any of these externals right they didn't have a, a they didn't have a initiation ceremony like that you know they surrendered that was the that's the essential thing the essential thing is to surrender and and that is understood only by understanding the meaning that's important the the internal is important because because draupadi gajendra and vibhishana they all surrendered without any ritual and they all attain moksha without any ritual so you can attain moksha without any ritual you can go to shri vaikuntha without any ritual even without getting the the mantra if you understand the meaning of the mantra they understood the meaning of the mantra but their surrender was in such a way that they that they understood the meaning of the mantra did not vibhishana understand that he was only to surrender to lord rama he understood that vibhish uh, 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 draupadi and and uh, and gajendra they understood they were they were only for krishna and for shriman narayana they understood that so what was the point of them what what is the point of a guru showing up and giving them a mantra and te- and teaching them that they understood it so they understood the meaning they were liberated they did surrender that's it finished they didn't need to be initiated into the mantra but it, traditionally we do it in another way we we give people the mantra we explain the meaning of the mantra and that's an easy way to do it right rather than trying to teach them without the mantra right so that's how these people attain salvation by by surrendering to the lord the lord himself is the means the mantra is only there as a preliminary means as stated in shri vachana bhushna the lord himself is the actual means <clears throat> so we'll meet again thank you jai shri narayana jai shri narayana Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much.